Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And I'm Jenna. Holy crap, we have a guest. <laughs> <laughs> Out of left field comes someone who snuck into the chat and is here to talk about Miami Vice. <laughs> you just keep pulling me back in. <laughs> well, Jenna, we had to. Had to have you come back for this episode. It is season four, episode seven, titled Missing Hours. Now, there are several, several reasons why we needed Jenna to come back for this. But first, before we get there, it premiered on November 13th, 1987. It is written by Thomas Dish, who this is his only episode that he wrote. Now, there's something about Thomas Dish. This is a bad episode of Miami Vice. And Miami Vice fans know this episode was coming. This is a terrible episode of Miami Vice that we knew that we were going to get here. Now, we're going to have a lot of fun with it, but Thomas Dish is a well-respected sci-fi writer. Three Hugo nominations, nine Nebula nominations. He is a fantastic sci-fi writer. And he's more than just a sci-fi writer. He, he wrote poetry. He also dabbled in children's books. In fact, the children's book series he wrote was The Brave Little Toaster, which... I happen to be the perfect age to remember that movie when it came out, as I was his target audience. Yeah, and that blew me away when I saw that he wrote that short novel, too. It is directed, now bear with me on this name, I think it's Ot De Jong. Looks an awful lot like Eight De Jong. <laughs> 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 this guy is also surprised because he directed the cult fan favorite drop dead pred oh that movie. <laughs> <laughs> there's something for everyone in this episode <laughs> before we get on to this episode normally we stop canceling on each other's lives but this time we're going to skip that because we got jenna back and there are a couple reasons why we got jenna back First, it's since episode 52. This is episode 87. It has been that many episodes since we've had Jenna on. She hasn't been on since season three, episode one, when Irish eyes are crying because she couldn't help herself and had to be here for Liam Neeson. Yeah, she had to be here for that. <laughs> Can't deny myself. Liam. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we like to assemble the entire crew, the entire go with the heat crew for special episodes. Evan, Out Where the Buses Don't Run, My Brother's Keeper, Lombard, Sons and Lovers, you know, when Tubbs' baby disappears. Tubbs Jr., where are you? <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> so, Jenna, we, it's been a while since you've been on. We want to make sure you're caught up to speed with what's happened since you were on. One, Tubbs had a baby. <laughs> Two, Tubbs lost the baby. <laughs> did, and did we happen to address where Sonny's kid is? Is he still in Georgia? Is that like a thing? Oh, we saw him. <laughs> yeah. oh, we he saw has him. a He's new okay. dad and everything. He's doing great. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He has a new dad that wants to adopt him. Little Timmy Billy. <laughs> Stevie. Steve, Johnny. Jerry? Johnny. Johnny. No, no, no. I like Greg the best. I'm going with Greg. That was John's answer. <laughs> Timmy Billy yes. Johnny Greg. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Following his son now lives in a house for homeless boys. <laughs> oh, oh. His stepdad and, and uh, Crockett's ex are going to have Do Doogie Hauser. That's going to yeah. be fun. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Terrific. <laughs> Jen is like, I don't know what is going on. I'm so, I am about as confused as I was throughout this entire episode. <laughs> In the 35 weeks, a couple big things have happened too. In music, we learned that almost every band got their start by stealing stuff from David Bowie. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Believable. And we lost a major vice character. It starts. It does. Larry, I can't even think about it. <laughs> Larry, we miss you, buddy. Well, Swy texts you. He's all alone still. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one last reason why we needed Jenna back on this episode. This is the final episode for Nougat Thank to God. make an appearance. Thank God for that. <laughs> and I think that oh, you know you love Nuggie. I hate Nuggie. <laughs> <laughs> I like Izzy. Izzy's great. I hate Noogie. I never like Noogie. I can't and believe I, that this is the final time that we're going to see the Noog Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Is I think Melissa speaks for regular vice. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> where me, John, and Jenna are an exception, where we enjoy the Noog Man, and we're going to be sad to see him go. So we had to have Jenna on for his send off. <laughs> And here I thought you were just trying to punish me with one of the weirdest episodes ever. <laughs> That's what I get for ignoring almost a season. Hey, you didn't have much the meat bondler. The meat oh. bondler is one of the weirdest ones. <laughs> <What? laughs> the meat bondler. Okay. He breaks in your kitchen, fondles your meat, and leaves a mess behind. Steals your pants. Steals your pants. <laughs> Steals your pants. Like <laughs> that does seem like a case for vice. I hope they got to the bottom of it. <laughs> well, there's some Was suspicion that Sonny is the meat fondler or is the new <laughs> meat fondler. So I would have guessed Switek. I would have guessed that that was the Switek thing. <laughs> well, speaking of painful. <laughs> now, Understatement. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that if you enjoy all of those other episodes that I listed it off like Evan and Sons and Lovers. Missing Hours has to be at the top of your list of favorite Vice episodes because, and I'm going to justify this throughout the episode <laughs> um, and at the end. So stick with me. Stick with I'm me. I'm already people. gone. I've lost. I'm gone. <laughs> I don't believe it. I'm sorry. You've lost me already. I've come to expect you to have a terrible opinion about things. So <laughs> I'm on board. I'll keep listening. It's going to be an interesting final thoughts. That's my thought on this. <laughs> Let's go talk about this episode. So we open up the episode of at Grove Harbor Cinema. Now, you know where this episode's going already. When we open up and Izzy and Nookie are pretending to be aliens, spacemen. What are they doing? They're selling well, a movie? What well, Nookie's doing? a spaceman. What is Izzy? Is he is he a spaceman too, or is he the alien? I don't know. One's wearing a helmet. I'm... What the hell is Izzy wearing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My favorite part is Switek is the ice cream man. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say I, I thought Switek had the best role. I thought he was making sandwiches, which seemed to fit. <laughs> No, so I thought I had missed something. Like I thought maybe I had like gone to grab a glass of water and like missed a critical point that introduced why they were pretending to fight out there. But I, I'm now I'm thinking that maybe there wasn't anything that was introduced. <laughs> Switek and Trudy are there on the stakeout. They're using Izzy and Nugget, I think, to identify a couple of men that are in suits behind our person that then freaks out when they walk up. The person that freaks out isn't what who they're there for. Yeah, uh, no, they, they're they there for the to... creepy porn guy who who's got like the ball who's bald with yeah. like the little bitty patch of hair. Uh, like uh, he couldn't be creepier. Ones, yeah, and they're yeah, John's right, and they're the ones that are supposed to do the deal with him. So they are supposed to meet him. They're just being whatever. <laughs> they're just being, being <laughs> so they just completely abandon that case, I guess, from this point forward. Yeah, apparently, yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds like that's pretty much vice. <laughs> no need to worry about that porn dealer. We've got. Bigger fish to fry. <laughs> in all fairness, things escalate pretty quickly. Then this person uh, in front of the person that they're actually waiting for sees Izzy and Nogi, especially Nogi, who is busy sexually harassing everyone he can get his hands and on. And stealing money from them. <laughs> yes. He sees Nogi with the helmet on, starts to go in like full-blown panic attack. His eyes even change color, runs for Nogi. Nogi ducks out of the way. The man jumps through a plate glass window, slices his neck, and dies. Freeze frame on Trudy as she screams for Stan. And we go to the opening credits. I mean, who knew that Nookie's costume was so accurate? <laughs> That's what they look like in space, okay? I think this might have now, happened I around the time that bath salts became a thing. <laughs> I did have that theory, but I have a bone to pick with Dominic because he said that the glass slit his neck and killed him. But in the very next scene, Big Booty Trudy, as her name plate <laughs> implies, uh, swears up and down that it was it was only a scratch. So no, she, yeah, she says she saw it and it was cut and it was a deep cut and that's how he died. Then the coroner says, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, that's not what happened. He died of probably a heart attack because look, it's a superficial cut." And so then that's why she's freaked out. She's like, "But I saw it. It was like pumping blood." It, it doesn't even cut. look like a cut. It's yeah, like it, looks, it like... looks like maybe he just had a neck fold. Like he's just <laughs> yeah, a little, exactly. like he was a little fat at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then when she's at her desk in front of her big booty Trudy sign, she says <laughs> nothing yeah. but, but sweet professionalism. <laughs> big booty yeah, exactly. Trudy. <laughs> well, John, at the precinct, Trudy is explaining to Tubbs that she saw the cut and he's having a good laugh at at her expense. 
important thing is happening here. The important thing is happening is that Izzy and Nookie want their money from Stan. <laughs> and Stan pushes him out the door while they're trying to have the conversation. And out in the hallway, Nookie turns to Izzy and goes, See, I told you you can't trust white people. We should have got the money up front. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm kind of thankful that that is his final line in this series because it seems very appropriate. <laughs> Just can't trust them white people. How and very self aware of the Miami Vice <laughs> writing staff. <laughs> and with that, we do say goodbye to Nookie. Bye. He's gone forever. <sighs> Nookie, we're going to miss you and your airman antics at the strip club. We're going to miss you not being able to control your body at your wedding when your wife gives you a sexual <laughs> dance at the altar. <laughs> your stripper wife gives you a striptease. Noogie, we're going to miss you stealing cement trucks with Izzy. Yeah, I mean, they were a good duo yep. together. I will give you that. But Izzy comes back, so that's all that matters. <laughs> He's all up in it until the end. Why are you acting sadder about him than you did about Zito? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm insulted for Zito's memory right now. <laughs> Acting like he was more important. <laughs> hey, we're a tight knit group here. We have to stick together. No one else appreciates Nougat Lamont. <laughs> and we have to hold it together for Miami Vice. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> While they're at the precinct, they also find out that Acres literally had nothing, nothing else on him but a wad of $1,000 in cash funds. And 12 jars of peanut butter. No, I think it was more than that. I think it was like 20-something jars of peanut butter. (laughs) Yeah, because when he crashes through the window, all the jars of peanut butter fly around, too. And then we get, I think, uh, what could be like the best line of the the whole episode. Swytek and Tubbs, I think. Ah, Trudy, creamy or crunchy? (laughs) (laughs) The peanut butter is a little bit suspicious. And and, I mean, it just keeps getting more suspicious. Because I mean, obviously it caught uh, our attention. It caught Trudy's attention. Trudy goes out to the guy's house and finds more empty jars of peanut butter. But what makes it really suspicious? No jelly. (laughs) (laughs) Also, we all know crunchy peanut butter is better than crunchy. Uh, no. That does not belong anywhere. In- <laughs> That's why I don't buy it in this house. No. I got time for that crap. I don't I mean, there's rocks no, with like, my peanut Why butter. would you even waste your time with creamy peanut butter? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not real peanut gross. butter. <laughs> this is clearly the start of the anti-peanut butter lobby that's led yeah, to exactly. years of people who make it so I can't bring my peanut butter crackers on a plane. <laughs> I have to agree with Melissa. I'm all about the creamy. The creamy's better. I don't want anything like it tastes like rocks in my food while I'm eating it. Thanks. <laughs> what kind of crunchy peanut If I want cocktail peanuts, I'll buy cocktail peanuts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got time for that. Tears up your bread and leaves holes and stuff. No, that's why you got to get a nice post on the bread. Give it some structural integrity. There's a there's a method here, Melissa. Come on. So Trudy's at this houseboat by herself, surrounded by peanut butter, a cuckoo clock, and a radio of some sort. <laughs> the cuckoo clock gets you now. Since like mid season three and up to this point, like the episode seems kind of off, but. You know what, though? The episodes normally kind of like find themselves at about this point, you know, and so like we don't think anything's different. We're just kind of watching along. And then suddenly the sky turns oh, yeah, that's orange got really and weird. it gets really smoky. And then Lou DeLong walks in and Trudy immediately recognizes him and says, it's you, Lou. And then music starts playing. Freeze frame on Lou. His face disappears while the clouds keep rolling by. Then Trudy's smiling face shows up in Lou's face. Yes. And then we have a freeze frame and we go to commercial. And you know you're on drugs now. <laughs> it's like the original so, ad for Photoshop. <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack here. Because Lou is played by James Brown, the godfather of soul. Who And normally at this point I would talk more about James Brown. But since he's in our music, I'm going to defer to my seg- my music segment. So we will talk a lot more about him then. Let's jump into Trudy doing drugs. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> especially because it's the 80s and so special effects aren't very good. Like, <laughs> it was just the most cornball, terrible scene, and then commercial. I just wish that at some point someone had explained why his face temporarily becomes 
like a clear day's sky before it turns into Trudy's face. I don't know. I, are, do you think they're trying to say like she turned into him or something? I don't get it. Or he takes her away. They have like, I don't a know, cosmic was, connection. <laughs> well, I got the feeling in the next scene, almost like she was possessed by James Brown. Yeah, where she comes in and she's too. singing. Talking all different and stuff. Where she's like, mm-hmm. what, my slip showing? <laughs> <laughs> come on like that would stop you trudy <laughs> <Stuff's always showing. laughs> well at the precinct castile walks out of an interrogation room lonnie's wife is inside she wants to talk to the cop that found lonnie now what's happening here is that because crockett goes in and finds out more acres her or lonnie has been missing for two years she's been looking for him all over the place he disappeared from elko nevada and then heard that he had shown up in miami and then she raced down there to see if she could actually find him he didn't disappear he was abducted by aliens they were both abducted by aliens it was actually pretty traumatic i would hope you would be more kind to someone who had went through (laughs) something so traumatic (laughs) (laughs) we, we all know dominic's long long history of being abducted by aliens <laughs> you know what aliens do they probe you <laughs> she says that she about 12 hours had passed and then she woke up and she, a patch of hair was missing off the back of her head how do you know <laughs> and then she said it had a scab already too right in the middle of it that's what i do when i wake up in a foreign place <laughs> Is run my hands through my hair and just check to make sure I've got no weird scabs on my head. Well, now I'm going to do that every time I wake up because I'm going to be like, did Dominic shave a circle in the back of my head? (laughs) I'm going to suggest that through all this, that this isn't a story about aliens. This is a story about cults. And that Astrolife, who reported to her that Lonnie was found and flew her out to Miami, that that they're a cult and she's part of a cult. And that aliens is just a cover for this cult that is harassing these people and that's why the patch of hair is missing off the back of my head i mean off of everyone's <laughs> head in, the, in this episode no they're no part of a cult. it's clearly about aliens uh i'm sorry it is clearly about aliens they do <laughs> exist people who go to nevada don't just randomly black out for 12 hours at a time <laughs> 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 Not with hookers either. <laughs> be airlifted out of the middle yeah, of the desert. I mean, oops, no. I'm going with government, secret government experiments with LSD. That's what I'm going with with this That's episode. what I thought too. Crockett is very confused. He says, let's at least go identify the body. So he takes her down. The doctor's there. It, we're waiting in the mortuary. He's like, okay, yep, here's the staff. And got the chore and it's empty. I like the way that he pulled it out and then he like looked back. Like maybe it just <laughs> fell back behind. <laughs> like your clothes in the trunk Sometimes they like, fall between it. the seat. <laughs> like look further back and then and then Crockett looks back there too, like <laughs> is there like some secret way that they can just fall out or what <laughs> well you know i mean if you close the drawer too forcefully it, there's a huge gap back there they just slide just right back off there. <laughs> it helps that they oil them up before they put them on the slab you know just to make sure also like how could you not tell by pulling it out there wasn't a person on it wouldn't it be like super like rip it open no. <laughs> because you think it's heavy with a body uh, I, like flings it open of how calm everyone is too you would think they'd be panicking like a body's gone but instead it, it's like oh hold on hold on maybe they took him out to give him a bath you know and they go get <laughs> go talk to the other doctor and the other doctor is like well trudy came in and checked him out and they're like okay you know and like <laughs> at that point crockett's like what do you mean like checked her out ch- checked out the body like a book <laughs> You know, yeah, what? This isn't and, a library. And I'm just picturing in my head Trudy just driving around with a body like weekend at Bernie's, you know, using the <laughs> carpool lane. That's why I text her that later on. Like, is she just like propped up in the back seat or what? Where's yeah. yeah. <laughs> or it's like, is he driving around with that uh, body taking <laughs> the Japanese investors yeah, I forgot. in the big thaw. Oh, By the way, Jenna uh-huh. that happened. had a frozen Rastafarian. Yep. <laughs> uh-huh. In a capsule. Sure. In a tube. That was one of my takeaways was they're, they're remarkably cavalier about all of this. Like the entire time that Trudy seems to be tripping off of LSD, everybody is just <laughs> so calm about it. Okay, it's fine. Uh-huh. We'll find the greased up dead guy somewhere and, you know, aliens and, and it's cool. We're fine. Could have Everything's got fine. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't have gone far. I mean, he's so stiff. <laughs> Upstairs, Gina and Tubbs are talking to Castillo. Trudy's still missing. Uh, they haven't seen her since she left uh, right after um, the opening. 
So they haven't seen her yeah. at all. I mean, uh, and then a man named Carson comes walking up. He says that he saw the story on his pre-internet, but still internet bulletin board, which is kind of cool, actually, that, that they wove that into this episode. And he even says, like, yeah, you should catch the new wave. It's this <laughs> internet. <laughs> <laughs> so has Carson been in episodes before, or is this our first introduction to Carson? This is the life and death of Carson. This is right there. You <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we never hear from anyone in Central oh. Records ever again this is our first time we meet carson who is played by chris rock comedian actor writer director producer obviously he's an insanely famous comedian this is actually one of his earlier roles he had only appeared in a couple small film roles before doing vice and then he would become a cast member on snl he would eventually leave from snl to do movies he would do new jack city uh, it was actually kind of interesting how he left Saturday Night Live is that they knew that he wanted to leave, so they like preemptively fired him. So he actually <laughs> appeared in six episodes of In Living Color, which was actually canceled a month after he joined them. Good Lord, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> His career just kept going up from there. He, star he wrote and starred in CB4. He kept releasing comedy albums. He had an HBO talk show called The Chris Rock Show. It, from 2005 to 2009, he developed, wrote, and narrated the sitcom Everybody Loves Chris. And then just, uh, just a ton of great comedy movies, you know, Dogma, Beverly Hills Ninja. He was in Lethal Weapon 4. Uh, grown Ups and Grown Ups 2. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, so, uh, some of it, what that I didn't know is that he was also the, an executive producer on the Hughleys. The world can never get enough Chris Rock, and it's. I am beyond excited to see that he's got new stand-ups. Mm -hmm. He's got one out right now and another one coming on Netflix. The world needs more Chris Rock. And so his character, Carson, in this episode, catches dad's attention and he asks him that, hey, so what's up? What do you mean? This is, He's like, like, oh, well, he's in a group about ufology or ufology. No, ufology. I think U he ufology and that the Elko kidnappings are famous. And he heard that Trudy had found one. That's the bulletin board is talking about, too, that Trudy had found someone from the Elko go kidnappings and then suddenly trudy just comes waltzing in singing the brown song or sorry Lou song Lou, come on. <laughs> burns a picture of the houseboat freeze frame commercial <laughs> and as we learn carson turns out he's miami pd's resident alien expert um also good news switech got some ice cream uh, but no body though Still haven't found that body. <laughs> if that body had a sandwich, he would find it. <laughs> hot dog cart? Is it next to a hot dog cart? <laughs> he will discover it. <laughs> uh -huh. Talking to Trudy later, she says that she didn't sign for a body. I don't know what she's talking about, but she's in a great mood. She's like, yeah, still, still moving the shoulders, like humming a song to herself. Like, no, I didn't sign for no body. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> she met Lou at the houseboat. She's very energetic, but also confused. Because she doesn't really remember things after the houseboat. Oh. <laughs> like, no. Or how she got there. Or well, I think because she's still drunk and clearly knows it. <laughs> it's all that peanut butter. Also, tea. Gina's a little jealous that she wasn't invited out to go drinking. <laughs> yeah, she's like, "What? You went drinking with this guy? He's just, he's a singer from the '60s." Like, what? Carson comes barging in and says, "Yeah, you definitely had an, a close encounter with the third kind." And Dad just buries his hand, his face in his hand, and says, "Gina, take Trudy to the doctor, please." Uh -huh. And he tells Switek to get rid of Carson. And then Tubbs and Crockett go check out Astrolife. He's very exasperated this whole episode. He's done with this <laughs> crap. <laughs> now, I need so as Carson to... pointed out, clearly a classic case of reverse abduction. So <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> also, uh, Dad, you're, you're right. In this episode, Dad is just in hell. The whole yeah. episode. Yeah. Like, what the hell is going on? This unstructured investigation with Trudy being gone and not checking in. What the hell is going on around here? And nobody thought it was strange. Like, eh, she'll come in. I mean, I mean, come on. Who's going to make the coffee? <laughs> Who's going to type things for us? Who's going to deal with central filing? We never have to deal with these people. Yeah, exactly. They literally haven't researched anything all day. No one knows where to find anything. Nothing has gotten done. <laughs> So now over at Astrolife, you guys are going to need to tell me, 
Help me out here. Is Astro Life a TV show? A live show? No, it's a live show, I think. And they just like film it. Okay. Astro Life and- is coming to a public library near you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because later on in the episode, he says they give their episodes, they give out their show to people. Oh. Okay. Remember when he talks about when they're not actually on TV, on. but they film it. They like film TV. it and then you can buy the you can buy the videos to watch them. Uh okay, public access. Anyone with fifty dollars and a crackpot idea. <laughs> And have their own TV show. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hosted by Lou, and it's all about the stories that people have and their amazing sexual adventures with aliens. Because <laughs> that's what the first person yeah, says. The first is person the talking best about sex of their life. <laughs> that couple, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, man. Probing, man. There's a lot of there's a lot of butt play involved <laughs> with aliens. <laughs> So what you're saying is people are lacking the butt play. <laughs> That's why they like the aliens. <laughs> Carson shows up behind Chris Rock knows. <laughs> yeah, I know. He comes out from like behind, underneath the curtain. He crawls out from the curtain. Yeah, he crawls out from underneath the curtain right behind Lou, too, who's on stage. And he comes walking up like, hey, guys, I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> They're like, have you ever heard of Undercover? I'm not even Tubbs, okay? (laughs) And then Lou's like right hand man, who's clearly an alien, starts shining like (laughs) uh, like one of those one of those lasers in Lou's eyes. How he doesn't blind Lou, I don't know. Those are definitely the kind of lasers that are like banned from kids shining them up at airplanes and stuff. Yeah. (laughs) So he cuts the show short. Lou comes off the stage. The duo immediately grab him and introduce themselves as Burnett and Cooper. Lou says, I never met Rudy. I never spent any time with her. I don't know, Trudy Joplin. I don't know why you're bothering me. He continues to walk on. The duo will catch up to him. And Lou says, yeah, I was abducted. I actually felt more like getting raped than it was. Yeah, that was a kind of a weird statement. Screen, so it was kind of weird. I told you. Really un- <laughs> totally probe. <laughs> Probe. Yeah, I mean, if it was like you're being raped, why did he make like a religion out of it? Like it was a good thing. I was confused on that. By the way, on a side note, he doesn't know a Trudy Joplin, but they never asked him if he knew a big booty Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she has like a name tag she wears. <laughs> like necklace. Lou strikes Pars- me as the kind of person who's always going to say that he doesn't know who you're talking about if you approach him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he is a man who's known for finding women on houseboats. <laughs> <laughs> Carson comes running up and says, Lonnie was an Afterlife member. And then another freeze frame. And then he Carson. runs away. <laughs> <laughs> Over at Trudy's, Gina's hanging out with Trudy. It's just playing on a loop, the, the Lou song. I feel good. And Gina's like dancing around trying to take care of her friend. Like, yeah, we're having a good time. I'm making a drink. And then knock at the door. And it's the duo plus Carson plus Lou. And Trudy's immediately like, you look old. Why did I go out with you last night? <laughs> she has regrets. <laughs> All that peanut butter got to her. And now she's like, why did I sleep with you? <laughs> I-, I love Tubbs, who again suggests that someone spiked her OJ. Because that is obviously the only way that you can do any type of hallucinogenic. Is if someone spikes your OJ. Lou says, I believe you. I believe that you saw an alien. It might have even been me. So step back and take a look at me. And then things get purple. And then <laughs> Trudy re- replaces Lou's face. <laughs> things get weird. When and then we have another free spring. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, Dominic, you wouldn't know unless you've been through it. She's probably confused. Her butt probably hurts. <laughs> This is the best sex of Trudy's life, I'll have you know. <laughs> she is big booty Trudy, so. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> so later at the precinct, Tubbs is telling Castillo that Lou's definitely a con man, but maybe not. I and Dan know. starts to believe it a little bit, too. It's like, maybe there's some aliens. I don't know. Maybe you should go investigate the houseboat. And said, so we can't because Trudy burned the picture and she never wrote down any of her notes. Like, well, what about the dispatcher? It's like, dispatcher suddenly blanked out thinking of Mamie Van Doren and it didn't write it down or lost it too. So yeah. no one has the address of Trudy magically shows up at the houseboat later. So they should, did they just ask Trudy? No. <laughs> uh, oh, no, no. They got a description from for, from Trudy. So they need to put out an APB for purple... Purple Guild monsters <laughs> with the guys. <laughs> no, once again, Carson knows. He said, how come you don't ask the widow? 
Yeah. The widow will know the house is. <laughs> so the duo go show up at a motel that night to go talk to Rana Akers. And that's the widow that we met earlier that's trying to find Lonnie or was trying to find Lonnie. But when they get there. Yeah, now she's just trying to find love. But when they get there, they see her being abducted by two men in black. And so Sonny goes to turn on his Porsche. It stalls out. He, they can't chase him. So they get out and try and say freeze. And then a beam of light hit them and bl- temporarily blinds them while the car gets away with Rana. That was the best part. That big blue light that just shines down. It's like, a, it's like a big square. Now, why don't we get to find out who Crockett and Tubbs envision uh, from the 60s, like, rock and roll thing? <laughs> That's what I want to know. The reason I made uh, I make the joke about R- Rona looking for love is that actress who plays her will return as Switek's girlfriend in a future episode. <laughs> yes, Switek has girlfriends. <laughs> he also has low standards. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Can she make a sandwich? This woman yes. thinks she was abducted by aliens. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe we'll get him closer to Elvis. Yeah, maybe she has an inside Elvis. <laughs> After the car gets away, Crockett checking on the car. Tubbs calls in on a payphone and says that some sort of aircraft blinded them. <laughs> Chumps. <laughs> and then suddenly the car starts. And now they're like, well, what? Maybe. M- maybe? Not, yeah, for yes. the record, not Crockett. No, not never buy Crockett. any of this. Yeah, because in, inside the hotel no. room, everything's normal. But Tubbs Crockett's is totally like, hey, drinking the man. Kool-Aid. Yeah, he's drinking it. <laughs> Tubbs says that maybe Rana got back to the mothership. He also says that maybe Trudy got taken, flapjacked her brain, <laughs> and shredded the dispatcher's log. <laughs> well, they did flapjack something. It wasn't her brain. Over at Trudy's, she's sleeping, reading a book called Missing Hours. Bing! <laughs> Wakes up and makes herself an English muffin. Knock at the door. Trudy grabs her gun. Goes over to open the door, and Gina comes running over and like slaps the gun out of her hand. <laughs> like, don't kill the paper boy because <laughs> he was singing the song. That's why. Now, this is I have I'm weirded out by this, and there's I have a question for you guys. They talk over breakfast, and Trudy says she's seen shapes and hearing noises. The song makes her panic when she hears it now. Uh, and Gina says, "Hey, you've had all this before. How did you get through it?" That time. Wait, question mark? What? <laughs> I think wait, she, like, she, she Did, dealt with hard times or something before. Yeah, like, wait, I, I thought that she she was asking, she was saying, okay, but you've dealt with witnesses like this before. How how would you get them through it? Oh, that's no, no, no. Yeah. Like, what she would experienced you have- the tragedy. The song was playing when her dad was killed when she was a, <laughs> a kid. And it's haunted her forever. I can't wait for the I, I think the one. only thing, <laughs> the, the clear answer here is that they should experiment with peanut butter and see if that <laughs> helps. Start slathering each other up with peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows how never wi- get that off? Who knows how wild it got the night before, John? The only things that were out were a couple of glasses from their drinks, peanut butter, and the uh, English muffins. <laughs> no one's wearing pants. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the scene fades, shot of the sky and the sun, and then the sun turns into a jar of stabilized peanut butter. Which I have questions about sta- what stabilized peanut butter is. We talked about it. I looked it up. We explained it. It's certainly. <laughs> <laughs> not what the mom's choice is. I'll have you. I'll have you know. <laughs> Choosy moms don't choose stabilized peanut butter. <laughs> they do. I just they imagine get government money. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say. I just. Camps, you get the go- I just ima- I imagine jump. elementary schools getting like giant tubs of stabilized peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. It just means it's got a shelf life. I re- I actually looked it up for Dominic. It just means uh, in the, not in the refrigerator and just in the cabinet and shelf life, it'll stay that consistency. So it's not That's natural. Wait, are you supposed like, to put peanut butter in the fridge? <laughs> natural uh, peanut yeah, butter. Some of them are. Natural peanut butter, yeah. Like like the one you separate oh. ones. I used to buy that for the kids. Yeah, natural they, and you have to put yeah, it in the okay. They okay. put like mind controlling chemicals in GIF that, that keep it so you can just leave it in the cabinet. <laughs> Yeah, Jif's not actually peanut butter. It's like <laughs> half sugar and then peanut butter. That's those fancy people peanut butters. I'm not buying any of those. <laughs> it's mostly lard. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear Trudy singing 
the song, I Feel Good, and the video of her appears inside the jar. Peanut butter, which then turns into a cuckoo clock, and then she starts to panic. Oh, God, it's them. Clock turns into the book of Missing Hours, opens it. Trudy's sitting inside of the book, starts to slide backwards. She's getting more and more panic, and then freeze frame. And we're back in the psychologist's office and the doctor asking her, do you do LSD? <laughs> Are you high? <laughs> How many My poppy only seed is... muffins have you eaten today? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> As we suspected, she was high on traces of bath salts. So <laughs> <laughs> out in the field. Tubbs calls in and says to Gina, I think it's who he's talking to on the phone, tell Sly. Sly. That's a different thing that we'll talk about later. (laughs) 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 To to let him know who's reported about aliens in the area. And then he uses the feedback that he hears that they're trying to locate where Rana might be. So they kind of like sectioned off an area where they can check where a bunch of people also reported seeing aliens. So it must be in this certain area. Sonny's busy investigating Carson's background. I, I was very concerned about Tubbs in this scene because of last week's forklift attack. <laughs> and the whole time he's on the phone, there's a tractor slowly creeping up on him. <laughs> and I was I was thinking, man, this tractor's going to pounce at any time. <laughs> and he's going to have to jump on some boxes and get out of the way. <laughs> old man, sorry, old, old man Tubbs, <laughs> senior, is going to have to jump and get out of the yes. way. With his wig on. <laughs> the ladies show up at the houseboat, which again, like, why didn't they just ask Trudy where it was? Anything. But <laughs> Gina finds Rana's body. She's dead and also has a patch of hair missing off the back of her head. Trudy leans down and then Gina sees that Trudy is also missing a patch of hair on the back of her head, just like Lonnie was in the beginning. Oh my God, it's really freaking aliens. And Gina's like, what's happening to you? That's the reaction you want. <laughs> Anyone else bothered by the combination of butter and yellow Gatorade? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah. Also, I'm, I'm kind of glad she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> also, the man who shined the laser pointer in Lou's face when they were at Astro Life, he's out in the rocks watching in his binoculars. He's just a creeper. <laughs> Glasses guy is very villainy, you know, like <laughs> hopping up behind the, the rocks, you know. Yeah, it, yeah, you, you know, you almost expect like the excellent. Everything's going according <laughs> to plan. <laughs> Fast scene at the planetarium where that man then also goes in and gets Carson and they leave together. Out at pit 18, which is where Tubbs found out from the man driving the bulldozer that they had some barrels explode the night before, but they didn't want to report it to OSHA, so he wasn't supposed to say anything. But he tells him, though. <laughs> but he tells Tubbs, he doesn't identify himself. He's just out there in a Cadillac. He's, out there. he's a businessman. Like, I'm a businessman, and we want, we want to invest. <laughs> he's like, well, I mind my own business, but there were some barrels that exploded. And they didn't want to tell OSHA because there's not enough people on. There was no people on the job site. Just me and my head. <laughs> Tub sees that Lou is out there. He's just sitting out in the middle of this thing he designed to make it look just like the New Mexico abduction in 54, trying to get the aliens to pay attention to where he's at. And Tub's like, I'm a cop. I want some answers. And Lou's like, I want some answers, too. That's why I set this stupid thing up out here. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know, that's some very special dark. uh, No, I'm just kidding. That's just cow poop. (laughs) Just raised cow poop everywhere. Well, after Tubbs caresses it and smells it and puts it to his face, he's then informed that it's like got (laughs) plutonium in it It, or something. It's radio. Radioactive. radioactive. He's like, dust the cans off. But you know, you can just dust off plutonium. Just get it right off the hand. You don't even have to wash it or anything. I mean, the hand sanitizer might work. I don't know. Uh, radioactive cow. You should see what they do to those cows. Uh, Lou says that Travis sets up a person who he's partners with who hired Lou to be part of Ashto Life. Says he sets up these meetings with sponsors every other week. Or every week, and that's why he's sitting out there. He's got like the tapes that he's going to deliver yeah, he's got, to sponsors. Yeah, like a package and, full of tape. I don't know. And Tubbs is like, "All right, I think I got enough out of you. You're really stupid. <laughs> I don't weird. have anything though. No, I don't understand. <laughs> so anything. I'm going to leave and go attack. What are you talking shoes? about? You don't have anything. The other, the other shoe is finally dropped. The alien's master plan was to fund a sponsor. 
public access show about <laughs> alien abductions. <laughs> They're trying to get their message out there. <laughs> and they like peanut butter. They want you to know that. <laughs> this is all a ploy for their next phase of marketing, which is about the sexual enhancement drugs that they're going to be peddling. <laughs> That's why they're only interviewing people who've had incredible sexual experiences. <laughs> no, no, no. Major League Baseball is behind this whole thing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Tubbs is like, whatever, Lou. Tubbs just says, I'm done with you, Lou. I want these two men who are up on the hill. And he goes driving after them. They get in their car and try and drive away. But instead of driving away, they just drive at each other. Playing a very game weird chicken. scene. <laughs> the two men, over at the last minute, roll their car down the hill. And Tubbs gets them at gunpoint. Then they decide, like, well, let's go finish this off in this barn. <laughs> instead of going back to the precinct, we're going to go be in this barn. And they're like, FBI or something? They don't, don't actually what they say are. what they are. <laughs> Let's not discount the fact that Glasses Guy made a friend. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that that's that's great for him. I thought, well, they work for the aliens clearly, but no, worse, they're they're some kind of feds. Yeah, they're definitely some kind of feds. They also say that they're in Miami because there's so many dr drugs. Yeah, so there's that. <laughs> they're clearly scouting locations for bee farms, okay? <laughs> like that's we all know where this is going and it's a whole nother far more successful series related to this bee farms. <laughs> <laughs> they're clearly spiking people's orange juice with LSD because Miami has such a drug problem, no one's going to notice. They also say they did it in Nevada too. So whatever the hell yes. they're doing, and they're bodies doing it. go missing all the time. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, Angry Tub starts to brew, and I start getting excited. <laughs> oh, he's no, gonna he's have gonna slap to, around. He's gonna have to sla slap some people around. My money. <laughs> Bitch slapping Tubbs is coming back, <laughs> but everything settles down, and we go back to the precinct. Ever since he got that beard, he's been so calm. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I mean, you know, if. It, Either he has to charge them or let them to go, let let them go, you know. And I mean, they've got a lot of stalking to do, so <laughs> they're kind of busy. <laughs> Trudy goes to see Carson. Carson says that on the forum that that radio that was out on the houseboat is similar to what's been happening at other places, and for some reason, a bunch of coordinates are being spit out on the printer. So he says, "Take me to that houseboat." Also, there at the same time or near the same time, Croc is digging in the fridge looking for some food tubs is saying that gina is watching rudy until she fell asleep then she went to the morgue to check on make sure that R rana's body was still there sunny says that carson also went to school in elko so he's like hopping around following where these things happen on purpose they go down to check on carson and the computer's still logged in spitting out that those coordinates and it logged into the chat room but he's nowhere to be Stan calls and says that Trudy's gone. She went to meet up with Carson. And Crockett says, because he knows everything in Miami, including based on coordinates, latitude and longitude coordinates, of course. they must be in Hurricane Hole. Because he knows where it's at, okay? <laughs> Are you questioning his coordinate ability? <laughs> and it's not weird that Swiatek is just hanging out by himself in Trudy's place. No, not at all. <laughs> Getting in her bed. <laughs> Out at the houseboat, the duo show up. Trudy is all drugged out, laying on her back, looking up at the sky, talking about how many stars she saw and like how it's amazing that there's just junk so, again. <laughs> so many stars, man. They're like yeah. everywhere and like nowhere at the same time. Like it's amazing. <laughs> so then he goes inside. He it, finds it, Carson. Before he goes inside, you see the uh, one of the glasses guys very nonchalantly like sneaking away. Like I, I almost <laughs> pictured him whistling in the background. <laughs> They grab Carson, grab Trudy. One of the glasses men says, hey, this houseboat's ours. Astro Life or um, Lonnie did to Astro Life, so we're keeping it. So he's like, whatever. Fine, 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 fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I'm taking Carson and Trudy. We're getting on our boat and we're leaving. They start to pull away. Then an electricity problem happens. Not like Bill Bob where he, his studio gets hit by lightning. <laughs> I mean, that is a thing that happens too. But, but just <laughs> electricity problems. Cuckoo clock starts going. Sonny's boat stops working. And boat explodes. The houseboat, not, not Crockett's boat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how serious <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> At the sound of the explosion, Trudy awakens from a nightmare. Oh, thank God. It was all just a nightmare. This episode of Vice didn't actually happen. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Wait. When she opens up her desk drawer, she is out of peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> 
in a picture of a houseboat. <laughs> Freeze frame for the eighth time and episode over. We did it. We got through missing wow. hours. <laughs> 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 this is a unique episode of Miami Vice, and I appreciate that oh, it ended in trying. a dream. <laughs> so stop that it, trying. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't part of the canon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, every show in the 80s that ended it in a dream. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God Bobby was not really dead on Dallas. <laughs> wow, spoiler. God. <laughs> spoiler. 35 years later. <laughs> I might have thought about watching it. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, too soon. I do appreciate this episode took a chance. Like it went way out there. I'm disappointed because we don't get that many Trudy episodes. And, and then that they this took a was chance a Trudy. For Trudy. <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing. It's probably the only one that would do it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the end of this episode. I'm going to come back to my final thoughts on this. We got, I think we got lots. So but let's first go break down this music. All right, John. I think I think I can guess one of the songs that's going to be in your music segment this week. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Dead silent. Really? <laughs> <laughs> kind of wait for you there to, go, to, to run with whatever you're going to say there. <laughs> He's like, okay, what song was it? <laughs> what song is it? <laughs> See, you don't know. Don't, don't act like you know my music. <laughs> oh, okay, so this week we have obviously James Brown, but first let's talk about Paint the Road by Adrian Bellew. Adrian Bellew, a U.S. musician, songwriter, record producer, and multi-instrumentalist. He was a pioneer with the guitar, mostly for his sound. His sound mimicked car horns, animal noises, industrial sounds, you know, kind of <laughs> abstract. Is he the guy from I am completely serious police? about this. He he he's really famous because he, he yeah, because he was basically uh like the guy from Police Academy but for guitarists. <laughs> he, he's best known for being the front man and co-guitarist of the band King Crimson from 1981 to 2009, though he's actually released nearly 20 solo albums as well. What caught my eye was that he, he has worked as a session musician or a touring musician for a lot of very, very big names. So he spent tours with Frank Zappa, toured with a, as a musician for David Bowie. <laughs> so there's your first Bowie reference. <laughs> Damn you, David Bowie. We thought we got rid of you. <laughs> oh yeah no 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 he's clinging to this music segment he also toured and recorded with the talking heads and even toured with nine inch nails in 1989 he had a top 10 hit with the song oh daddy and he also had a grammy nomination in 2005 with beatbox guitar in the best rock instrumental performance category most notably for just all the appearances and all of the other big artists in the mid 70s he moved to nashville and joined a, a regionally popular cover band called sweetheart playing gigs locally with sweetheart in 1977 he was playing at fanny's bar when he was discovered by frank zappa who was tipped off by his chauffeur to go check him out so zappa did invite him to tour right away way and so by the time zappa invited him to to come tour with him sweetheart had broke up so he flew to la all by himself and he auditioned and he actually screwed up the first audition but he talked zappa into giving him a second audition and there you go he started opening shows for zappa uh and even appeared on zappa's 79 album chic your booty your bounty your very strange name <laughs> <laughs> Even appears on a track. He would later say that he went to the Frank Zappa School of Rock. After touring with Zappa, dabbled with a few of his own bands. He would have bands called Gaga and the Tom Tom Club. But he would also tour with Bowie, contribute to Dave Bowie's live album Stage, and also record as a session musician for the album Lodger. So, and then he would start doing session work with the Talking Heads. And actually, a few of the Talking Heads band members sent him to replace the lead singer david byrne but he was like no nah, guys i don't want to do that like that would be kind of a d-bag move so instead they did a spinoff band called the tom tom club things didn't work out people's feelings were upset some of his stuff was erased that didn't make the album so essentially huh. he went back to doing solo work and did a pretty much 
did solo work and worked with also did session work until as well as continuing to perform with King Crimson until 2013 when Trent Reznor would announce that Bello be Nine Inch Nails new touring guitarist. But that also wouldn't last very long, long enough for him to do some session work on Nine Inch Nails hesitation mark. But yeah, we found someone else. So he is actually still, <laughs> still gets together and does shows with King Crimson. So now we move on Damn. to the epic James Brown with the song I Got You, I Feel Good. James Brown is the godfather of soul. He is an icon of 20th century popular music and he's had a career that's lasted 50 years. Doing research on James Brown, I learned two things. One, he had a huge influence over music over that 50 years. And... Two, in re real life, he was not the best person. In fact, he all <laughs> often made very poor, poor choices. <laughs> We're going to learn a little bit about both. As his career began as a gospel singer in Georgia, actually his early life is really interesting. And I, I, I'm, I think you could even make a movie about it. I mean, as a, he grew up poor, uh, there's performing for change he boxed as a teen and then it was actually at 16 was arrested for robbery and was sent to a juvenile detention center where he would start a quartet with his fellow saints until he would be released once being released he would join a vocal group called the Gospel Starlighters. So the Gospel Starlighters also featured Bobby Birds. And actually, Bobby Birds was uh, the lead singer, as James Brown was actually just the backup singer. So the Gospel Starlighters would become the Flames. And in the late 50s, they would get a little bit, they would start touring and get a little bit of popularity. And they would become the famous Flames, because obviously they're famous now. <laughs> and they would have a couple hits with the songs Please, Please, Please and Try Me. So, and Brown had uh, built a reputation as a tireless performer. As they were trying to get big, they actually reached out to Little Richard. And I mean, just, I don't think people even realize how massive an impact Little Richard had on things because Little Richard actually helped them, convince them to audition for his manager and actually helped them get signed by his manager, which actually his manager then got them their first record deal. So, but after they got the record deal, things would kind of get moved around and, and the band would kind of reform as the band would break up. They would let go of Clint Brantley, Little Richard's manager. They would hire Ben Bart and they would basically reform band more set around uh, James Brown as the lead singer. What was What's interesting to me is that all the original members that left, the old lead singer, Bobby Bird, stayed. And actually continued oh. with what was now James Brown and the Flames. Yeah, that is surprising that he that they would be able to keep him. You would think that he would say, okay, fine, you guys have fun. I'm going to go start my own band. Yeah, it, it, exactly. James Brown's success really peaked in the 60s with his hits, Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, I Got You, and It's a Man's, Man's, Man's World. By the time the 70s hit, he had kind of gone away from gospel and actually got more in the funk, changed the name of the band or reformed the band again. This time, the band would be known as the JBs, and he would release records, Got Up, I Feel Like Being a Sex Machine, and Payback, and he would really kind of usher in funk. And, and not just there. At that time, the Collins brothers, who were in his backup band, they would eventually move on and become integral members of Parliament Funkadelic, which oh, is the damn. funk band that uh, George Clinton is famous for. Yeah. Damn. So from Little Richard to George Clinton, uh, we're having an influence. L so, Little Richard, James Brown, and uh, and Funkadelic all together. Like, and George Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. So the 70s would be a confusing time. So uh, a lot of people don't know that Brown kept a strict non-alcohol and drug policy for him and his band members and actually routinely fired people for if he caught them drinking or using drugs. But now here comes some of the poor choices he made. So we'll start with... Uh, <laughs> Um, in 1972, he openly supported R Richard Nixon in the election, which <laughs> hurt his sales in 73, and things <laughs> hit kind of a lull. He would continue to see success in the, in the 70s, including 1976's single Hot, I Need to Be Loved, 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 Loved. God, he had a thing about that with song titles. 
<laughs> which uh, that song specifically borrowed a riff from David Bowie's fame. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get away from him. David Bowie's everywhere. So, He's in and once again, <laughs> once again, we're stealing from David Bowie here. <laughs> so, granted, the riff was actually was originally created by Carlos Alomar, but was brought to Bowie and Lennon, who wrote the song "Fame," and then ripped off by Brown. By the way, Carlos Alomar, who wrote the riff, briefly in Brown's backing band in the '60s, <laughs> and I believe he was one of the people fired <laughs> for drinking and doing drugs. <laughs> it's a vicious cycle. <laughs> the vicious cycle. The reason wait, I brought wait. up the non jug thing. Wait. wait. Okay. Be- you're saying that David Bowie stole a riff from someone. Sorry, let me back up. That James Brown stole a riff from David Bowie, who actually stole it from someone who worked for James Brown? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Carlos Alomar was in, his, in Brown's backing band in the 60s. He would leave. <laughs> he would then create a riff that he would sell to John Lennon and David Bowie, and they would use it in the song Fame. And then James Brown would hear that riff and go, man, that sounds good. And he would <laughs> steal it. <laughs> Probably sounded good because that guy used to work for you in the 60s. <laughs> in the late 70s, early 80s, so 77 to 81, popularity fell off with the emergence of disco. And this is where that strict non-alcohol drug policy kind of falls off because – once the, once the 80s came about, rumors of drug use started to swarm around James Brown. Primarily, the use of PCP and also used to like to put mixed cocaine into his menthol cigarettes. Damn. Um, yeah. Whoa. Getting, getting things done. That will uh, mess you up. Holy crap. <laughs> so... Even though musically his popularity was down, he would still maintain his popularity just by appearing in films. He would appear in Blues Brothers, Dr. Detroit, Rocky IV. He also would change, reform the band once again from the G's, and now they would become the Soul Generals. But that's the last time, I swear. We're never going to change the name again, guys. <laughs> <laughs> he would also start teaming up with other artists. He would have a hit in 84 after teaming up with Africa Bombada with the song Unity. Africa Bombada also was featured in our music previously. And actually, in the late 80s, early 90s, he influenced a lot of rap. Actually, uh, artists such as da- Big Daddy Kane and MC Hammer basically sampled James Brown songs in some of their songs. And one of James Brown's songs was very popular with breakdancers to the point Curtis Blow once said it was the national anthem, breakdancing. Hmm. And he would continue to make music and do cameos into the 2000s and even into uh, all the way up until his death in 2006. Now, got to talk about the dark side of James Brown. Throughout the 80s, and, and uh, well, through his whole life, he had gotten in trouble with, the, he had been in trouble with the law, stemming all the way back from his robbery arrest and, when he was 16. But especially in the 80s, he would be arrested multiple times for domestic violence. In the 80s, he would actually serve two and a half years of two concurrently running six-year sentences <laughs> for aggravated assault and other felonies. And dude, some of them stories are crazy. Involving like car chases and stuff. He made some Damn. bad choices. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow he got out of it by only serving two and a half years. So not to mention years of tax trouble. And to culminate all of that, he had four failed marriages. And when he died in 2006, at the reading of his will, it was revealed that his will was actually pretty old. It had not been updated in quite some time and only recognized six of his children. Oh. At, at, the, <laughs> at the time of his death, at the time of his death, he recognized nine children. That's important. So only six of them were recognized in the will, mostly because two of them hadn't been born yet. And there was one failed marriage that hadn't happened yet. Big fight broke out over his estate, which allowed people to get basically say like, hey, he's also my dad to get their DNA Ted. And so he recognized nine children uh, uh, by the time he died. We know that there are at least three more children, illegitimate children from extramarital affairs. He could have up to 13 children. 
One is the jury's still out on one, I guess. <laughs> it's continued all the way up from 2006 to in 2015. Yeah, the ex-wife who was left out of the will because the will was made before they had ever gotten married. Uh, she was granted a right, some rights to his estate. She was ruled his widow. So, and that was in 2015. I had a feeling the, this was uh, coming with James Brown professionally. You can't be any more accomplished than James Brown was. Uh, no. Like I said, he's such an iconic musician and performer, but just not the greatest guy in real life and, and <laughs> made some pretty bad decisions and was arrested and drug issues lasted at least until 98 when he went into rehab for prescription drugs, which is... Well, I will say two things about James Brown. One, Rocky IV is the best Rocky Come at me. Go ahead. Try and convince me it's not the best one. Because I live in America. Best, it's the best moment in film history, okay? Everyone just shut up. That's the way it is. You're really <laughs> like, All you're that. doing is just making it harder for people to believe you when you say that this episode is good. You're adding more fuel to people's fight against you. <laughs> to appreciate James Brown, the musician, go to YouTube, search for James Brown live or concert. And there's a bunch of them that are full concerts that are on YouTube. They are um, amazing. I never get tired of watching James Brown live. Oh, yeah. And his live stuff, he was actually one of the first artists to really sell live albums. Like, they didn't sell very well uh, to begin with. Uh, like, uh, back in the day, live albums didn't really sell very well. When he started releasing live albums, some of his most successful albums were live albums. Like, he completely changed that. Yep. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I gave my final thoughts about James Brown. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Jenna, you're our guest. What are your final thoughts on this episode? So, I mean, I have to admit that I came into this episode with not high expectations because I assumed <laughs> that you were going to try and punish me somehow. You were going to invite me in for like the best episode that they've had since Liam, right? I was very happy to see the Noog Man and I'm sad to see him go. What I would really love is to just point out that this is totally not where Trudy's story needs to leave off. She's clearly having a nervous breakdown. She clearly has a long lost brother named Carson who may or may <laughs> not have been abducted by aliens when she was younger. And I really think that like, this is where the story can split off for her. Why, why it didn't, I will never know, but that's what, uh, that, that that's what we need to cling to for this because <laughs> it's worth it. All she needs to do is meet up with, with the X-Files gang later on, she's like number one for their type of cases. And they'll find Carson. He was everywhere. <laughs> he knew everything. I actually, I thought I thought it was, was decent, uh, if not very confusing. But <laughs> 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 I think I could say that for most of the episodes of this program that I've, that I've witnessed. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I have a few theories that I'm trying to work out here. One is, did you notice that the people were only high on the houseboat? Maybe there was a gas leak or something. <laughs> like, like That's where they were exposed to the drug, was clearly on the houseboat. And they had to keep that houseboat moving, which is why they, could, they had such a hard time finding it. <laughs> so well, you saw how quickly think, it exploded there's clearly more going well, on there and, and i think this could clearly be like a, a tuskegee type experiment with you know the feds you know they're feeding lsd to these people don't get me wrong the alien angle still holds merit you know and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna ignore that maybe they were really abducted i'm not gonna accept this as just a dream episode that was all a dream I refuse to accept that. This ha <laughs> happened. She woke up because she was all uh, th she was all drugged out, and that was her waking up after the drugs uh, had worn off. So it all totally happened. She was abducted by aliens or experimented <laughs> on by the government. I believe. I'm with you, John. I really am. I'm with you. They can't silence us. <laughs> we know. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I'm afraid. <laughs> it's trash. <laughs> it's 
garbage. That, that's my final. I'm glad the Nook Man is gone. There you go. That was the, that was it. He's done. I don't have to see him anymore. I don't like. He this doesn't episode mean at all. that. I miss you, Nuggie. No, we don't. No, I don't like this episode like at all. So <laughs> there's, there's no redeeming quality in this episode. None of it. <laughs> I'm the resident expert, and I love Vice. And I always, for the record, I've seen it what like six or seven times now, all the way through. I always skip this episode because I don't got time for missing bodies and UFOs or drugs or dreams. I got to get to amnesia. <laughs> hey, so it's one if, more thing I can. If skip. Rona's dead, how is she gonna date Swytek? Is this are his standards that low? <laughs> Is it shocking to know that they're going to bring her back as a different person? <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to close this one out with final thoughts. And I've been saving them. I've been saying, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to defend this episode. And, and I'm going to defend it two different ways, okay? One, cults and aliens were big in the 80s. And I really think that based on the writer of this episode, this was to talk about cults, not sci-fi. It's to talk about cults. And there's a new Netflix documentary that's going to be coming out very soon about a cult in Oregon that tried to poison an entire town to win an election. Okay, so and they tried to do so by giving people salmonella as salad bars. Now, before you go too crazy, huh. it is Oregon things happen <laughs> do they have so, a log in sneeze guards <laughs> in the 80s cults were a thing people were nervous about cults this could be a rip from the headline i think this episode does a good job of the cult aspect especially with all these wheels spinning that, that you don't know who's turning them and so you don't know what's happening and who's doing what it's definitely drugs they got patches being put in it's not aliens it's cults they're tracking them that's why they always know where trudy is now two and this is the real part this is the real serious where i'm going to defend this episode yes this is the episode that jumped the shark Yes, this is be the beginning of the end. Vice is what people say. I don't believe them. <laughs> Sunny Burnett amnesia episodes are coming. All right. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I blame this episode on NBC. And this is not Vice's fault. This is not the writer's fault. This is not the actor's fault. This is on NBC. On January 20th, 1987, the same year this episode came out, Unsolved Mysteries hits NBC. And I think that it got into the executives' heads at NBC. And this is a hype episode for Unsolved Mysteries. Robert Stack, you ruined Vice. This is on you. <laughs> <laughs> Talk ill. He's dead, man. He can't it yeah, now. man. He's dead. It's totally a mystery, you know? <laughs> and now with Vice gone, we're never going to solve it. <laughs> oh, my God. Unsolved Mysteries was on Friday nights, too. Exactly. <laughs> This was a hype episode <laughs> for Unsolved Mysteries. It was NBC asking Vice, which was declining in ratings, to do a pump episode for Unsolved Mysteries. They did it about alien cults. I'm surprised there wasn't crop circles in this episode. Mm -hmm. It led into the Power Hour, which then is Unsolved Mysteries, which to bring it all home in 2008, when it re-aired, the person who was the host of Unsolved Mysteries was Dennis Farina. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get yourself wound up in all that string on your corkboard there, Dominic. Careful. And, and on his way into the studio to record, he was listening to David Bowie. It all comes back. It all comes around, guys. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, goalwiththeheat.com. Now, before you turn it off, hey, your podcaster platform or your, your podcatcher, you can tell it like, hey, go ahead and cut off the episodes early. Don't do it right now. We got to give a shout out, actually, because Jenna was on this episode. Not that we're happy that she was on here. Happy to give a send off to the Nook Man. Happy to be here for Jumping the Shark. But just in case you didn't know, Jenna created all of the show art for Go With The Heat. Our logo... Our, the design on the website, everything that you see, our Facebook icon, our, our Twitter bio picture, everything. All of our design work has been done by Jenna. Oh, hey, thanks. Now I just need to <laughs> Thank go you. and expertly crop out all of their faces and put Trudy's face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
So yeah, if you'd like to see more of that or maybe a sticker pack coming in the future of that artwork, check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Click on About Us. You can find everything and all the ways to contact us. Click on Subscribe. You can find all the ways that you can find the show. Click on Support. We would love your support. Support step number one. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and give us a review. Two, email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Three, check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash GoWithTheHeat. We would love your support. Be sure to check those things out. Check out the website. Check us out on social media at Go With The Heat on Twitter. Facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. Brand new Instagram account. Can you guess where it is? At Go With The Heat. <laughs> People are That's never going to get it. that, Dominic. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.